Uh, first off, congratulations on this very impressive piece of work. I'm wondering if you could just comment a little bit about the immunotherapy data you presented for the solid tumor group. And I, uh, my understanding from what you presented is that uh, this would need to be individualized for each patient based on the antigens that their tumor is expressing. And I'm just wondering how you see that carrying forward to apply to you know the millions of people with cancer and how that commercialization track might work. So as you point out, this is in a sense yeah, one more time. As you point out, this is in a sense the ultimate in personalized medicine because one has to take a patient's own cells, isolate reactivities against an antigen unique to that patient's cancer, and give them back. So there's good news and bad news. The good news is that since virtually every cancer has mutations, and in over 80% of patients you can attack those mutations on the cancer, they exist, the immune cells exist in the, uh, in the patient, you potentially have a blueprint for treating virtually any cancer type. That's the good news. The bad news is, as you point out, it's highly complex and therefore it's difficult to widely apply. But that was what I encountered when we treated our first patient with CAR T cells. How could that be commercialized? You have to send a pharesis sample to a central laboratory. They have to genetically modify it. They have to send it back. Uh, and it was the pioneering vision of, of several entrepreneurs who said, hey, I can make that into something that can be widely available. And now patients around, certainly the United States and Europe and Asia are receiving this therapy. And so it's my feeling that when you can find something that works against a disease as devastating as cancer, and all of us have family members and friends who have suffered from this, if you can find something that works, I have every confidence that the genius of industry around the world will find out ways to, will find ways to bring it to the people in need. Um, can I ask you a little bit about your concept of neoantigens or tumor antigens, I guess you might call them tumor specific antigens. And, um, have you sequenced these uh, tumor antigens either at the level of the protein or uh, messenger RNA? And, and is it, um, in other words, if, for instance, there is this specific neoantigen in a disease like colorectal, um, is the reason why you might only get a 15 or 20 percent response um, because not all of the tumors express these neoantigens? And, and so, um, it, it might be that you're activating lymphocytes and they're recognizing that particular antigen, but it's not expressed or it's suppressed in other patients. So we can find T cells that recognize cancer antigens in over 80% of patients. And the 15% response rate, I think, is predominantly because we're just getting started. The first patient we ever treated with this was about four years ago, and we're finding better ways to purify the cells we need because there's heterogeneity and expression of these antigens within a patient, we need to target multiple antigens at the same time in much of the same ways that combination chemotherapy can attack, uh, can attack cancers when a single individual agent uh, cannot. But I've skipped the details of how we actually find this. And so what we have to do is do a complete genomic sequence, whole exome, se not genomic, but whole exome sequence of the tumor as well as an RNA-seq that is sequencing the expressed RNA from those, uh, from those uh, exomically uh, activated genes. So we do that by taking a piece of tumor, doing a whole exomic sequencing in the RNA-seq, and that today takes mm, 10 or 11 days, and we do that in my own laboratory in a couple of more days of the bioinformatics. And inside of two weeks, you know every mutation that exists in the cancer. And the, sequence, the secret to developing this treatment was the development of high throughput techniques to examine every mutation in pools to see if, in fact, T cells can recognize them. And so the average epithelial cancer will have somewhere between 50 and 150 mutations. We actually have techniques for interrogating every mutation to find the ones that are actually recognized by the immune system. So they're quite rare. The cells are present in small amounts. 
uh, a tiny frequency, and we have to then increase their frequency. And in fact, what we've just begun doing this past year is identifying the very receptors on lymphocytes that recognize the mutation and put them into a patient's own peripheral blood cells for therapy, much as we did for the CAR T cells. So it's very much an evolving area of, uh, of translational research. There are many groups that are beginning to do it, and I expect to see this, uh, the response rates increase dramatically. And in my own view, this represents uh, the targeting of these neoantigens represents the most effective possibility we have right now uh, for improving cancer treatment in the years to come. Um, do, do you foresee that uh, this type of therapy will eventually replace some of the very toxic therapies that we use, like chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation? Uh, or those other therapies that have, carry significant morbidity and mortality. So one of the beauties of targeting the unique antigens that are expressed by a cancer is by definition they're not on normal cells. And so you don't get side effects from toxicity uh, when you give these cells. Now you first have to lymphodeplete the patient to get rid of T regulatory cells and other regulatory elements before you uh, before you transfer uh, these cells. So their toxicities uh, are benign compared to that of many, other, of many other approaches. But as is the case for the development of treatments uh, against desperate diseases, there's a role for many different kinds of treatment that can be combined to be more effective than any one. Right now, 80% of everyone cured of cancer is cured by the application of surgery, if you can catch it before before spread. So I expect to see surgery and radiation therapy and chemotherapy continue to have applications, but I expect to see much more uh, in the application of these immunotherapies. And we're seeing that at the major cancer meetings now, where immunotherapy was a, uh, a forgotten stepchild uh, of therapy. And now a th fully a third of all the talks that one hears at the major uh, annual meetings that deal with cancer research and cancer treatment are revolving around immunotherapy. So there is one question from uh, Dr. Shoji Lokato. In the 1930s and 1940s, the percentage of people, the total population affected in Japan was very little compared to today. Every third person is diagnosed with cancer in Japan. And most of the developed nations say so. Does it mean that there is something wrong with the immune system over the decades? It has gone wrong so that it, it has become weaker, that cancer has taken over? That is his question. Well, it's a, wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful question. We can detect T cells that can recognize the cancer, and as I've mentioned, a little over 80% of patients. So the immune system is active. It's just not active enough to keep the cancer from growing. And by stimulating activated T cells with interleukin-2, you can manifest immune reactions. The new checkpoint modulators uh, can unleash some of this existing immune reactivity, predominantly, again, in patients with melanoma, kidney cancer, smoking-induced lung cancer because of all the, the carcinogens that are present in, uh, in cigarette smoke. But the common epithelial solid cancers are, uh, except in rare circumstances, uh, not able to be successfully treated with the checkpoint, uh, checkpoint modulators. So the problem is not that there is no immune system. It's not that there are some cancers that are immunogenic and others not immunogenic at all. Uh, the problem is that the immunogenicity of most cancers is, is too small uh, to be recognized. And the challenge of immunotherapy is to take advantage of that pre-existing immune response with low frequency and increase it to be an effective treatment. So the immune system is active, just not active enough. I have a question. So after you had completed your medicine, I what? You, you had completed your medical school, the primary medical training. Right. What inspired you or what made you take up biophysics as a doctoral program? Well, 
I knew in becoming a doctor that I didn't only want to practice the best of today's medicine, I wanted to be involved in creating the medicine of tomorrow. And especially in surgery, where you operate on a patient with cancer, you've taken out everything that can be seen, and yet over half the time the cancer will come back uh, and cause devastating consequences for the patient. So I knew I wanted to do research. But in doing research, you have to be able to bring information from all areas of science and engineering to bear on a problem. And in my view, the major role of education is to keep you from being afraid of what you do not know. And so I found when I completed medical school and my undergraduate work, uh, I didn't feel that I knew enough. And so I went into biophysics to expand the range of knowledge that I had so that a problem when it arose, I wouldn't be afraid of using things that I didn't, I wasn't aware of. One needs a broad scientific base uh, that you can draw on when you're, doing, uh, when you're doing research. And so it took me a long time. I was 34 years old before I finished my training. Uh, and achieved this position at the National Cancer Institute. And I would urge the young students that are hearing this to try to broaden their knowledge so that they can bring all, bring all aspects of, uh, of modern science and engineering to bear on the problems that they choose to pursue. Thank you. The, do you want to just expand a little bit on the dose of the tills, or if you're going to, like, you're expanding the mix vivo, Dr. Rosenberg. So, yes. in other words, you take them out. And I remember when I heard your first lectures, you used to collect them. And um, but they're being expanded through IL-2 stimulation, or um, which is an elegant way of doing it, rather than doing it inside the body. But um, once you expand them, is have you, through your experience, is there a specific minimal dose of tills? That that's my first question. Is in other words. 10 million, 50 million, 100 million? Um, that's my first question. The second is in terms, immunologically, we always think of making space. If we're putting cells in, uh, the, the system has, it seems to detect how many cells there should be within this compartment called the body. So your myeloablation, and we sort of alluded to that with some of the things we're doing in tolerance, um, is it's partial myeloablation, not total myeloablation. You're, um, you're using an incomplete myeloablation and then giving the tails back. And is it one dose, two? It's, so first of all, the dose and then the frequency of giving the tails. Sure. So, so this, is a, this is a quantitative battle that's taking place between lymphocytes and the tumor cells. Uh, and mind you, we're isolating the T cells from a growing tumor. So they're in the cancer, they're just not active enough. By taking them out, we release them from the tolerogenic and energic influences that exist inside the, uh, inside the body and expand them. We try to give a minimum of 10 billion of these cells. But one of the problems we have is purifying them under the good manufacturing practice conditions that are required to uh, insert cells into, uh, into patients. And so we need ways to increase the frequency of the anti-tumor cells we give, which is one of the reasons why now we're isolating the receptors on the reactive T cells and putting them in to either naive or central memory circulating T cells that have an explosive proliferative capacity compared to the till themselves that have been so stimulated inside the body that they can't expand very much. But we see about a thousand-fold increase in the number of anti-tumor cells in a patient within the first one to two weeks of the, uh, of the administration. And so giving enough is critical. And right now, the way we isolate them, we need about 10 billion. It takes us about three weeks to grow up enough before we administer them. As we get better at it, we'll require will require fewer. Now, if you were to give the cells into an attack, a patient with an intact immune system, they would not work very well. And we started doing that. It was only in 2002 that we realized that you had to eliminate the body's own natural lymphocyte compartment. And not only lymphocytes, but myeloid cells. And so we give doses of cyclophosphamide and fludarabine that have no impact on the tumor but can eliminate circulating lymphocytes down to zero 
at, on the day of the cell uh, administration. Now it's a non-myeloablative regimen. So everybody recovers in the eight to 10 days after we give the cell infusion. But during that eight to 10 days, the T regulatory cells have been eliminated, the myeloid derived suppressors, uh, and you can increase the response rates dramatically compared to putting it into an intact immune system.